education providers need to learn and adapt themselves to that new social fabric. Because technology is changing. The traditional image of people reading a book or a newspaper has given way to that of commuters on the train, plugged into their iPhone, logged into Wikipedia or YouTube, blogging or Twittering, sharing images and experiences from around the world. Informal learning takes on a whole new meaning then for the net generation, free from deference and hierarchy, taking its cues from peer-to-peer -peer recommendation rather than the instruction of elites setting and destroying trends at breakneck speed. And because jobs, businesses, and indeed public services are changing, something like 80%, percent perhaps, even more, of how people learn their trade, learn their job, is informal. Workers learn much more from watching others at work than from asking their colleagues calling the help desk or through trial and error on their computer than from formal structured training. Not only are businesses demanding a workforce that meets the demands of the modern workplace, but employees are demanding the same level of investment in their own future uh, and for their employees. And finally, because the global economy is changing, for a young person, at school today, just as for a business competing in a crowded marketplace. Skills and a passion to develop skills at a pace required for the modern business environment have never been more important or a more important uh, prerequisite for succeeding in the modern economy. And when I talk about that modern economy, let me make absolutely clear when I was Minister for Culture, I learned this fact. It was something that was celebrated in the creative partnership schemes that we have in so many of our schools where we bring culture to young people that haven't had it before. And that is that 60% of the jobs that young people enter in primary school today will be required to do when they actually enter the workplace have not yet been invented. That requires imagination. It requires adaption. It requires curiosity. It requires the ability to come together with people with whom you share nothing. It requires critical thinking. It requires dedication and skill. It requires application. And all of that, all of that activity, all of those skills are caught up in the business of informal learning. Many of them are not skills that you have as a consequence simply of passing a qualification or an exam. And that is why the business of culture and informal learning is so important, because we want fully rounded citizens. We have a commitment to that. I believe that my party has, has a commitment to that. That's why we set up the Arts Council. That's why we set up the Open University. That's why we made entry to our national museums and galleries free. And that's why we have launched this informal adult consultation. So this is certainly an opportune time to be discussing not only informal learning for pleasure as tens of thousands of people up and down the country seize the chance to return to some form of education in colleges, in community centres and in cyberspace, but also to be discussing informal learning that means both the fundamental human urge for intellectual stimulation and allows people to form social bonds through the sharing of interests and passions, because learning is part 
of a story of a good society, not just a strong economy. The reason I'm so passionate about apprenticeships is not just because they help people gain a craft and a passport to a better job, important as those things are. It's also because apprenticeships offer young people the kind of personal development that they can so often miss out on. And the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills was created because it understood the breadth of all of that experience. And this is a view that I take from my own experiences in my life. My mother, who very sadly passed away a few months ago, was the direct beneficiary of a trade union which encouraged her to retrain in secretarial and in business administration, having been a home help. And so when she made those steps into learning, as a consequence, it affected her family. And that is one of the reasons that I stand here uh, before you. And it's something that obviously I take on to my own children that golden thread, one individual in my family getting that bug and being able to take that forward and that being passed on through the line. That's why this is so important. And obviously I see this. I see this in a very real way, representing one of the poorest communities here in Tottenham. What I want for my own children, I want for those that I was at school with, too, and who still deserve a second chance to gain the skills that they never did at school. Creating opportunities for the next generation emphatically does not mean giving up on this one. And that's why public investment in further education has increased by over 50% in real terms since 1997. Why funding for English language courses has trebled since 2001 to the benefit of 2.2 million people. And more than 175 million adults have improved literacy and numeracy skills as a consequence. You may not read about those 1.7 million adults that can now read, that now know what it means when they walk into a shop and see 30% off in the January sales. You may not read about them in the newspaper. But it's taken public investment, it's taken good teachers, and it's taken the decision to invest in all those adults because they were left behind uh, in the past. And I applaud all of those for what they have done to create and bring about that situation. We also want the current informal learning landscape supported from the National Lottery through to the private sector and by voluntary organisations to remain diverse and creative. And that's why we're also investing £210 million each year in informal adult learning for the next three years through a safeguarded budget. And we allocate our resources, of course, also to the trade union learning and, of course, to NIAS as an institution. 